<laughs> That's how we think of him anyway. Yeah. <laughs> All right, great to see you. Gosh. Hey there. Hey there. Well, I, was, I was had so much wanted to get you to on campus, but I'm so glad that we can do it. I mean, physically on campus. I'm so glad we can do it at least this way. Thank you. Nice to see you. Thank you. Good seeing you too. So you got a chance to meet everybody in person. Yeah. We did. Wonderful. Yeah. So Father David, let me just, since we've just got a few minutes, I'll just say, I said some of these things already, but just so you know how things flow uh, for this on the webinar, I'll start things right at three o'clock and I'll hit that button. Oh, it looks like we're already broadcasting, Chris. Oh, shoot. I think I accidentally, I must have accidentally pushed it. I apologize. I, I, I it said start webinar. And I thought I, I haven't used this before. So I, so if you want to publicly chastise me go ahead you've got some audience there for that so no and i think at this point it's going to be easier just to leave it open than to close this we need new links and so on so we're just going to stick with this just remember that someone might be observing us at any moment um, so father david i'll just say a few brief things about this and attendees may start popping in and if they do i, I may sort of just say something to them briefly about um, we'll be ready to begin in a moment. So uh, I'm planning to start at three o'clock. Uh, I'll welcome people briefly. I just have a very brief thing to say and to welcome you then to be the, to introduce the event and to, as the host. Uh, and then I'll turn my camera off and Chris will turn his camera off. So we won't be recorded and we'll just record our guests and you and Edgar. Um, and then you guys are moderating the questions. The Q and A box will be uh, open at the bottom for you and Edgar. I told I told you know Stephanie and Bob just to leave that alone. They don't need to worry about it. You, you're welcome to look at it if you'd like to, but um, you can let uh, Edgar and Father David take care of it. Um, we'll Edgar, try to... Edgar, do you have any special way you want to handle the Q and A, or you don't want me to just to do you want to? Uh, do you mind reading the questions, Father Eric? Sure, happy to do that. Sure that uh, yeah. If they put them in the chat, or I guess people. Well, I guess that's the only way they can do it, right? Right. That's right. So oh, what I can do is I, I can keep track of the questions. And if you, for some, you skip one, I can remind you or. Okay. I'll, I'll just, I'll keep track of them and then I will read them. And then I guess you'll run, you'll be referee. If someone needs to cut somebody off, you'll do that part of it. Just or do you want me to run all of that? Um. um... I think it will be easier. I mean, if you do it just because. Okay. Uh, sure, I'll take care of that. You have more experience with this uh, type of uh, event. <laughs> <laughs> so Father David, once you've come to kind of a natural stopping point around 4.30 or so, uh, if you just wanna, you know, you can just thank our you guests can. and thank the audience. And then I'll stop the recording. You don't have to worry about that. Um, and then once I stop the recording, I'll turn my camera back on and uh, we'll still be live at that point, just like we're live right now. We've got a few attendees joining us. Uh, we'll still be live at the end and just keep that in mind as we say thank you and farewell. Okay. Thank you. So um, I'm going to just turn my camera off for two minutes, I think, and let the attendees come in uh, and then I'll come back on and I'll welcome everybody. Okay. Right. All right. Thanks, Chris. Hi, Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want uh, questions during your your presentation, or would you prefer to wait for the all of them till the end? I prefer to wait. Okay. Yeah, let's wait at the end. That'd Very good. Thank you. We'll be about twenty to twenty five minutes each, I guess. So grateful that Edgar could, was willing to uh, do the welcome and the going to be the one of the hosts on this. Perfect. Very, very happy to do it. No, it's, uh, it seemed uh, not just because you're Mexican, but I mean, you're from Mexico City, but also, you know, just to get a chance to, to work with you and your department a little bit. And, you know, I'm just trying to do, I've got so many things going on. I'm trying to keep everybody happy. And sometimes I just, I can't keep up with everything, but this is one of the ways to, 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 to show some collegiality and try to figure out how we can work together and right, no, connect with other departments on the campus. No, and I appreciate it. And yeah, we're very excited to keep the collaboration between your program and my, and my department. I mean, okay. there's a natural connection, but uh, 
we still need to well, let me know what else we can do i mean i because there's somebody in your apartment or part of the program and right so let me know how i can how i can help so okay father david are you ready yes. i'm ready good afternoon everyone welcome to the providence college humanities forum my name is raymond hayne and i'm a member of the philosophy department here and a member of the humanities program and the director of the forum the Humanities Forum is an initiative of the Humanities Program here at PC and exists to provide a regular space each Friday for the entire college community to reflect on some of the deepest human things. Before we begin, let me remind you that today's event is being recorded and will be uploaded to our website early next week. Please also remember that you can ask a question at any point during today's presentation by typing in the Q&A box that's available at the bottom of your screen. You should feel free to submit questions whenever they occur to you during the discussion. And as always, we'll do our best to get to as many of them as possible before we conclude. Today's event is a special collaboration between the Forum, Latin American and Latina Latino Studies, and the Department of Foreign Language Studies. It's my pleasure now to turn things over to the host of today's event, Father David O'Rique, a Dominican priest and associate professor of history and classics here at PC, and the director of Latin American and Latina Latino Studies, Father David. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. We're great to have you here uh, so that we don't spend too much time on uh, initial comments. Uh, we're delighted to be able to, to, to host this event with the Humanities Forum, and we'll now turn it over to Dr. Edward, Edward, Edgar Mejia, uh, the uh, chair of uh, the uh, Modern Languages uh, Department. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Hain and Father Arik for the, your invitation to present the speakers today. Um, over a year ago, uh, we had the opportunity and thanks to the efforts of Father Arik to hear the distinguished um, historian Matthew Restall discuss his book on the encounter of Moctezuma and Cortes in 1519. Uh, and today we're very, very lucky because we have not one distinguished uh, historian of colonial Mexico, but two. So we're, we're <laughs> doubly lucky. Um, I'm gonna present the speakers very briefly because uh, I'm, I'm sure you're uh, eager to hear their talks. Uh, I'm gonna start with uh, Dr. Stephanie Wood. She's the director of the Wired, Wired Humanities Project and Research Associate at the Center for Equity Promotion at the University of Oregon, where she also teaches. She has written extensively on the interpretation of colonial manuscripts written in Nahuatl, map making and systems of remembrance that have allowed Mesoamerican communities to make sense of their place in the uh, colonial realities that they experienced. Uh, she has been the recipient of numerous grants from the National Endowment of the Humanities, one of which uh, it's very fascinating to me as a uh, a teacher of uh, languages. Um, it's called uh, an online Nahuatl lexical database bridging past, present, and future. Uh, and um, this database um, seeks to bridge the gap between modern and classical Nahuatl in order to enhance a speaker's literacy and access to historical sources. And I cannot finish this presentation without mentioning her influential book, Transcending Conquest, Nahuatl Views of Spanish Colonial Mexico, in which she reevaluates the conquest by turning to native sources from different regions in Mexico to show that these communities were the subject of their own history, uh, had their own identity, and engaged with invading culture in complex and nuanced ways, nuanced ways not only as victims. Um, professor uh, Robert Haskett is a professor emeritus of history, also at the University of Oregon. Uh, Professor Haskett's work has focused on the dynamics of conquest and colonialism at the local and regional level in colonial Mexico, in particular as it relates to systems of governance, land property, label systems, gender history, to name a few. In his book, Indigenous Rulers and Ethnohistory of Town Government in Colonial Cuernavaca, Professor Haskett documents the persistence of indigenous systems of governance, including local elections and complex political ideologies that resisted and adapted to new colonial realities. Professor Haskett also edited with uh, Dr. Stephanie Wood, Indian Women of Early Mexico, a landmark collection of essays on the field of colonial women's and gender history. He has been awarded several grants from the National Endowments of the Humanities, 
and he received the prestigious William Spence Robertson Prize for best article in Hispanic American Historical Review. He's currently working on a book on indigenous labor in the Tasco Silver Mines in Colonial New Spain. Welcome and thank you for uh, accepting our invitation to come to BC. Thank you. So I guess I'll start off if you want to get your get PowerPoint going. going. So we need to share screen. One second, everyone. Thank you for your patience. And we will hit the green button here. Oh, and play from start. All right. So this is the sort of the general title for both of our presentations. Um, and we'll, I hope along the way, we'll become clear by what we mean by, uh, by the term reinventing the past or the phrase. Um, I uh, want to first uh, foreground the still dominant narratives. There are really three of them about what happens uh, with the fall of uh, Tenochtitlan in 1521 and its consequences. Of course, the probably the very best known uh, is still the Spanish one, uh, the triumphant one written by Spanish conquerors and then uh, other Spaniards later in the colonial era. Um, more recently, although now decades ago, uh, I guess, thanks in part to the great Mexican historian Miguel Leon Portilla, uh, we have an account from a different side, uh, mostly based on uh, one account, but a few others, that focuses mainly on the uh, memories of people in the first half of the 16th century who lived in Tenochtitlan and the uh, sister city, so to speak, of Tlatelolco. And of course, instead of triumph, that account uh, emphasizes loss and despair. Um, this has long been called the indigenous account, but I'll speak a little bit more about how accurate that might be in a moment. Uh, these two kind of got combined in a third narrative that also is still quite alive and well, uh, called the Black Legend, which emerged particularly in the later part of the 16th century during the Elizabethan age when Spain and England were at loggerheads and it, it's rooted in that conflict. It was um, revived in 1898 when the US went to war against Spain in that uh, little conflict. And um, also has some roots in uh, old and somewhat enduring prejudice against Southern Europeans, including Spaniards. Um, but none of these are really the whole story. And um, particularly if you start looking beyond the Valley of Mexico into other parts of Central Mesoamerica, you find other indigenous voices, uh, particularly those looking back in time to 1521 and what happened in that era and trying to redefine uh, or if you will reinvent their histories, but sometimes not really even a reinvention because we have to remember that we have the so-called Aztecs and that's one group that was affected by the Spanish invasion. But there are all sorts of other people who basically never saw themselves as being conquered. And in fact, saw themselves as being part of the victory of the allied armies that attacked uh, the Aztec empire and brought it down. Uh, they've been um, <clears throat> dubbed uh, in fairly recent times by scholars as indigenous conquistadors. I think Stephanie is going to speak a little bit more to what we should do with that title. But anyway, in other words, the idea that indigenous people, just like Spaniards, or maybe sometimes even more so, were responsible for the fall of the Aztec Empire. Um, and here is one of the best known examples of that point of view, a, a sort of fourth narrative, I guess. Um, and that is from the well-known Lienzo de Tlaxcala, which is uh, from the principal allied uh, group of, of indigenous people. And you can see here that there is a Spaniard mounted on a horse there with a nice big spear. There is a group of Spaniards, but also indigenous people behind him. But who's in the foreground? Well, those are Tlaxcalan warriors vanquishing the common enemy. Um, so they're kind of foregrounding themselves as the uh, real 
military force that defeated the Aztecs in this thing. Um, now, this thing. Oh, we got stuck here. Oh, oh we did. Can I can't see here. There we go. Um, that pictorial kind of source and others like it created in the colonial era, in the Spanish era, uh, is joined by another kind of genre that also has information about the uh, fall and uh, the role of indigenous people in the defeat of the Aztecs. Um, we called them primordial titles. Um, I won't go into great detail about what those are, but they're uh, often written in indigenous languages. The, you see a page from one of them here uh, called the primordial titles of San Juan Bautista Tenango de Popula, which is uh, in central Mexico. So that's a Nahuatl language alphabetic text. And uh, also a group of uh, later colonial pictorials of various kinds called mapas or lienzos. And it's from these kinds of documents particularly that we get a sense of how indigenous people in central Mexico were defining themselves in relationship to what happens in 1521 and afterwards. Um, one thing that they often bring up in these kinds of records is the importance of what I've called the paper shields, or in other words, coats of arms that are in a European kind of style. And uh, the people of San Juan Bautista Tenango Te Popula uh, claimed that they'd been given such a thing by the king uh, through Hernando Cortez himself, actually. And just to give you a little sense of what this was supposedly like, um, it's if you look at that quote there on the right-hand side of the screen, it's, it's very European. It has fleur-de-lis in it, had tigers in fields of gold, and it has a Latin motto, I am faithful to the end. Um, and oh, I see there's a mistype there. Anyway, um, this was also sh the same exact title showed up in another primordial title from another community called San Nicolas y San Pedro. Um, so this is kind of a first case study of three I hope to present about indigenous views of invasion, conquest, and whatever that don't fit into the better known narratives that still dominate so much of our understanding of what happens. So here is from another document, the kind of thing I'm talking about with paper shields. On the right, you see one that's extremely European. It's actually based on um, the crest of Leon y Castilla in Spain. But the artist, uh, and this is probably 18th century, on the other side there has created a sort of indigenous style coat of arms, if you will. Uh, Stephanie has studied this more than I have, but you can see uh, sort of stylized, pre-Hispanic style sword, quote unquote, the Macquawi there, and an arrow or a spear or something. But there's also a European style uh, trumpet of something or other underneath it. Um, now, in the primordial titles, which are written for and sometimes at least by indigenous authors, you would expect to see more of this kind of, oh, woe well, is us, we lost, but that's not the message that usually comes out of them. And in fact, very often, instead of any kind of military conflict against Spaniards, the Spaniards simply kind of arrive, uh, emblem under the leadership of uh, Cortes, whose name is variously rendered uh, such as it was in the Tenango Te Pupula primordial title. And this title is accompanied by a Spanish language uh, grant document basically that was supposedly uh, a grant of land and privileges to Tenango Te Pupula made in 1525 by Cortes. And one of the reasons for this, if you see the quote there, Indian caciques and principales of the Pueblo of San Juan Tenanco de Popula welcomed Cortes. They supplied him with lamemes, which are porters, for his expedition to pacify Aguas de Peque and Quanahuac. Um, if you look at the a very similar document that's attached to the primordial title of San Nicolas y San Pedro, um, that one says, we did what we had the power to do when Cortes came, he was fed, and with the Christian faith and baptism. 
So they're emphasizing that they welcome and autonomously, voluntarily, they're helping the Spaniards. So it's not exactly the narrative you might expect. Um, and it comes though from a, a reality. Spaniards relied on indigenous people and their communities to keep the peace in the countryside for the entire colonial period. And they had to rely on the local indigenous leaders to do that. Um, they didn't want all the indigenous people to be killed or disappear. They definitely needed them to remain allies. And so this doesn't mean that uh, what they created was a sort of Eden-like uh, landscape and society for indigenous people. There were a lot of bad things that went on for sure. But over time, the indigenous leaders at the local level realized that it was the royal government and its representatives, particularly high level ones, and sometimes ones conveniently long dead, who had guaranteed their autonomy and their continued ability to maintain their communities. On the other hand, these same documents do recognize that other Spaniards, particularly ones closer to the local scene of state owners, um, petty officials of various kinds who are subject to bribery and things like that, and even sometimes a, a local priest could be problematic. They could actually be people who disrupt things. So they tend to look toward royal power and recognition of that authority coming from the royal government as sort of acting like the paper shield of the crest. It protects them. Um, so in their narratives, just to give you a couple more examples, and this again is a, a pictorial depiction of it. They, uh, they take the lead, they are the actors. The Spaniards are sometimes kind of catalysts, but it's the local indigenous people who take the lead in the events in these kinds of sources. Um, so here, just a few, I won't go through all of these, but you can see how uh, local nobles uh, assert all kinds of things that they did to help as allies, the Spaniards. They helped the Spaniards build the famous brigantines on the, the lake system in the Valley of Mexico. And they also usually emphasize how good they are as, as Catholics. That they're the ones who actually did the work to bring very ignorant people who live in the world in the sway of demons and things like that under the protection of the Catholic Church. They sometimes do it because someone like the Archbishop here asked them to do it, but it's often just autonomous. We did it ourselves. And you see this kind of narrative coming out all over the place. So um, that is, we'll come back to this, but that's one of my uh, case studies. Uh, there are two more, and this, instead of having to do with documents, have to do with two figures who really did exist, who are remembered later in the colonial period as very important Nahuatl or indigenous conquistadors, but they're kind of problematic in some ways if you look at the historical records, one of them more than the other. Uh, one of them uh, is a fellow from the Tlaxcala era area named Axioteca. I know it's kind of a hard name to get your tongue around, but he is best known as a terrible monster, actually. Um, he is part of the reason we remember three young newly Christianized boys in the Tlaxcala region who are now known as the three boy martyrs of Tlaxcala. The first one was named Cristobal and it was Axioteca, his father, who got so mad at him that he uh, basically murdered his own son for defying his authority by trying to force him to become a Catholic when he didn't want to. This story gets repeated over and over again in various chronicles, in paintings like the one you see here, and then the one on the right in a book published in 1921 about the boys who've actually now been uh, canonized by the Catholic Church. Um, and in the 1521 books, all the stops are pulled out. Axel Tecat not only murders his son Cristobal and also Cristobal's mother, but in each case, he opens the chest of the boy and the woman, takes out their hearts and eats them raw, uh, which is something that doesn't actually appear in earlier accounts. But you know, he becomes this horrible monster. 
But wait a minute. If you go to the Lienzo de Tlaxcala, there is actual Tecat welcoming the Spaniards and their translator, Doña Marina, to his home community of Atliwetzian, which is in the greater Tlaxcala region in central Mexico. Um, he's allying himself with the Spaniards and, and becomes uh, uh, well enough thought of by the Spaniards that Cortez is supposedly uh, giving him a sword and also an image of the Virgin Mary in thanks for his help. If you go to Atliwetzian today, um, and you wander around the center of town, you see this statue that's on the right in the picture there. And that's a heroic statue of none other than Akshoteka. There's a legend or a narrative a bit on the base of the statue. It doesn't mention a thing about him being the murderer of his son, Cristobal. He's just this very heroic indigenous conquistador-like figure there. Um, in 1582, there was also an investigation into uh, some miracles that were attached to the little image of the Virgin that was originally given to Axel Teca by Cortez. She's known as uh, Nuestra Señora la Virgen Conquistadora, who's now housed in um, the, San, the Franciscan monastery in, in Puebla, the sort of capital of this region now. Um, in 1582, the idea was to explain how the Virgin got to Puebla uh, because there are some people in Tlaxcala who claim it should still be there. Um, I won't bore you with the details, but there's a long investigation. Along the way, a number of local indigenous lords of Tlaxcala are interviewed by a Spanish priest, uh, and they tell him all about how Axel Tecat had and honored the Virgin and um, had her in his house and this and that. Uh, but eventually the Franciscans decided this wasn't a, a very good thing. So they took it away from Akshot Tecat and eventually it ends up in Puebla. But none of these witnesses mention a thing about Akshot Tecat murdering his son. They just describe him as a loyal ally of Cortez and the Spaniards who got these gifts and then explain why the Virgin didn't end up staying in Tlaxcala. Um, so the dominant narrative remains the murderer, Akshot Tecat, but there was another tradition that still sort of alive, uh, where Akshot Tecat is actually a heroic indigenous conquistador. We'll come back to that too. But uh, the third case study has to do with another indigenous noble uh, named um, Don Zacarias de Santiago. Uh, you can see him depicted in an 18th century um, mapa, so-called there on the left. Um, he's wearing kind of a traditional outfit uh, with some modification. It mainly looks like an indigenous lord from around the time of the Spanish invasion there. But of course, he's standing next to a coat of arms too. Um, now, he was remembered, in other words, as a Nahua conquistador who was honored by the Spaniards. Uh, and he was the lord of one of the four main political subdivisions of Tlaxcala, a place called Te Tepetipac. Um, and he's said to have met Cortez and done some other things. However, the problem is he didn't actually have any political power in Tepetipac until the last decades of the 16th century. Um, in other words, he couldn't have met Hernando Cortez himself. He was an ally of Spain though. In fact, at one point, he and a delegation of other lords from Tlaxcala in the 1580s actually went to Spain, met with the King Felipe uh, II, um, won some tax exemptions from the King and also got a personal grant of a coat of arms from Felipe. So um, he was a kind of conqueror, but not, in the sense of a military one, and certainly didn't live in the early 16th century, except perhaps as a very small child. Um, but not only does he show up in that one Lienzo as a conquest or invasion era lord who gets honored by Cortez, um, he also is borrowed by another community called Tlatlauquitepec, um, where he, you can see him kind of outlined up there in the upper right corner. 
again in a sort of quasi pre-Hispanic outfit um, and he's flanked by yet another coat of arms. This has to do with uh, another community kind of adopting him as their <clears throat> heroic indigenous conquistador ancestor who's there presiding over their later colonial claims to uh, the legitimacy of their land tenure. It's sort of the same in that earlier document I showed you. Um, here's a blow up of him on the right there. You can see he's really pretty much dressed like an indigenous lord from pre-Hispanic times, except he has a kind of Spanish style hairstyle there. And uh, then this is the coat of arms he's standing next to, which uh, is sort of, it's very European, except it does have a few uh, indigenous devices in it uh, in the lower right quadrant, it looks like a feathered shield, for instance. And there's a sort of uh, indigenous style dwelling above it, probably a local a government palace or something like that. So what can we make of these things? Um, well, um, what we have here, if we, if we start with Don Zacarias, um, he was prominent enough, some way people remembered him well enough to borrow him as a decorated indigenous conquistador who lived uh, at the time Cortez arrived, who personally knew Cortez, who helped Cortez, um, and who actually presided over a series of different grants of land and stuff supposedly given by Cortez in 1525 to indigenous communities in the region around Tlaxcala. The problem with all of this is, of course, we know he didn't live at that time. He didn't have any power at that time. And also the, um, these grants made in 1525 came at a time when Cortez wasn't actually even in Mexico. So there are some red flags there um, going on. Um, if we look at uh, Axiotecat, um, he really was an indigenous conquistador. He did live at the time of the Spanish arrival on the scene. Uh, he was valued by Cortez. There's no reason to, for us to doubt that he was given the statue of the Virgin of uh, La Conquistadora or that he, Cortez gave him a sword. Um, um, but what happens is we end up with two competing images of uh, Axoteca. Uh, one, the terrible ogre who murders his son, um, and the other, uh, an enduringly uh, heroic indigenous conquistador. Um, it seems to me that in both cases, these figures become heroes and indigenous conquistadors at a time when communities, particularly in the 18th century and maybe the late 17th century, are fair, facing more and more pressure as uh, Hispanic society is expanding in Mexico, as more and more inroads are being made on the uh, integrity of indigenous land holding, as people feel that their authority at the local level as political figures may be challenged by outsiders. And in the 18th century, even uh, some of these uh, borrowed ancestors who are putting together these mapas in the uh, 18th century, the little communities that do that, uh, maybe are even trying to break away from other indigenous communities that have been for a long time as uh, sort of their local overlords and they want to become freer of them. So there's a lot going on here that means trumpeting your mastery of the Spanish system, the fact that that mastery and your legitimacy is a land holding political entity uh, with a local autonomy um, was rooted in your help for the Spaniards. I think that's what's going on. See the same thing in the so-called primordial titles, those textual documents. Um, now, what about though this, uh, to kind of wrap things up, what about the charge that these things are concocted because there's so many disparities between what we know of what we would call facts and what's in these things. Um, Stephanie and I both worked on this. Stephanie, and I totally agree with this, argues that uh, although these things may have been manufactured at some level in workshops for communities who didn't have these kinds of records, 
that dated from the early 16th century, but they felt they needed them. Still, it looks like there's a lot of local content in them. And uh, you'd, so you do see figures who really did exist, like Don Zacarias de Santiago, populating these things. Um, real Spaniards are in them. And there are also other things that I haven't gone into that uh, seem to be rooted in local oral history and things you can verify did happen or, or exist in these communities. So local people had some input into the creation of these narratives. Um, so they weren't just fakes, even though um, sometimes these uh, Spanish language land grants seem to have been copied and recopied. And in one case, an investigation found one of them had actually been darkened by smoke uh, to make it look older. And yet, um, we can't just say, oh, they're just fake and they don't help us understand anything. As Matthew Restall said, uh, we might be better uh, served to look at them as, quote, authentic 18th century contrivances, unquote. In other words, they're reinventing or refiguring the past in a way that serves interests of people in their own present, that helps them survive colonialism and to maintain things like local pride even. Um, and reminds us also that many of these people really did ally themselves with the Spaniards and remembered that too. And it was a source of pride as well as legitimacy. Um, so the bottom line is there's just, it's not simply one binary good versus bad, black and white or whatever, in remembrance of the Spanish invasion of 15, that ended in 1521 in the Central Valley of Mexico. There are all sorts of very complicated multiple memories of this. And I've probably said too much, so here's Stephanie now. Okay, bear with me for a moment while I get my slides up here. Let's see, let me close this one at the top. Okay. There it goes. <clears throat> okay, and here's mine. Going and slideshow. I'm sorry. Okay, so I don't know how many of you have heard a presentation in, in which a married couple each has a voice. <laughs> um, so it's probably a little bit unique for you. Um, and it's fun for me to see how much our voices melding into one almost after 40 years of being in the same field, uh, teaching and publishing together. Um, so what I'm going to say will echo some of what Bob said, but I also have uh, my own twist on a few things. So I hope that will become noticeable as well. So we're both rethinking the significance of 1521 and its consequences. Uh, and we're both rooting our new interpretations in the historiography of the Nahuas themselves, both alphabetic and pictorial manuscripts. And when I say alphabetic, I mean in Nahuatl, written with the alphabet uh, that was introduced by the friars. This is a vast archive of manuscripts, thousands of manuscripts, especially the alphabetic ones, but also many, many pictorial records. Um, and so uh, to just share with you some of my interpretations, you heard a little bit about my book, Transcending Conquest. Well, I continue to um, try to avoid conquest and get us to think beyond that more European label and look for the Nawa view because conquer and conquest or conquista y conquistador in Spanish, those words were brought into Nahuatl as loan words. They didn't have an easy equivalent that they could use in their language. And I think that's really an important point to remember. Conquest and conquerors, they didn't have that in their language. And it's, it's kind of ironic because of course they did build an empire, the Aztecs did, and there were many Nahuas involved in that. Uh, they were very proud of their warriors. Their warrior culture was very strong. Uh, they defeated hundreds of other indigenous communities uh, across a vast region that included both Mexico and parts of Central America. So here's an example of a, a, a 16th century manuscript that recounts uh, and names all the towns that were brought into the Aztec Empire in the late 15th century, uh, one by one. Are you supposed to be showing us a video right now? We're supposed to, we don't have any images. You don't have the PowerPoint. I don't. Okay. I don't see anything. Do you, do you, uh, Edgar, oh. do you see? No, no, no. We don't. We don't see your okay. screen share. Okay. Let me try and see if I can remedy remedy this quickly. Um, 
I think I go down to screen share. I think you probably know that though. Yeah, it's funny. Oh, there we go. Okay. I don't know why it turned itself off. We <laughs> play from the start and go to the next. Like, how about now? You see it? Can you see the image? Yes, we can. I now can see it. Yes. Okay, great. Okay. So there you see the temples toppling over uh, with smoke and flames coming out of them. This is page after page, 212 indigenous communities in all that were um, defeated and brought into the Aztec Empire. So as I said, the Aztecs were imperialists and they did take over a large number of communities. However, it wasn't total destruction. Uh, these were towns that were defeated at the highest level, but then brought into the empire uh, and protected and would survive because the labor and the tributes that could be extracted from them were what was really sought after. And interestingly, when the Spanish invaded, they followed this pattern of colonization where they also wanted the tributes and labor. They, they tapped into the very same structures that the Aztecs had in place to a certain extent. Of course, there were some changes, but um, as time went by and Nawaz were affected more and more by by European perspectives, they would come to see the European invasion and seizure of power as a watershed moment in history. Um, but they never really saw it the same way the Spaniards did, as the way as Bob already mentioned, um, as this great heroic uh, and ma major defeat. Uh, they actually saw themselves as having a major role in it and surviving and even being strengthened, as I'll share in some examples. Um, so the, um, here's another scene from the Lienzo y Tlaxcala where you can see the, the Tlaxcaltecas were leading the way. We have Doña Marina following behind them and Spaniards behind her. So, you know, they again were the heroic figures and the ones who really defeated the Aztecs, if you will, in, in their point of view. Um, and there are many, many manuscripts where it seems the Spaniards are playing a supportive role, not just the Lienzo y Tlaxcala, but there are other examples. Um, Nawaz would kind of see the Spaniards as helping them conquer the Aztecs, uh, Nawaz from other regions, um, and they would help recreate this empire, having a, a significant role in it, in their, in, again, from their point of view. Now, who were these indigenous conquistadors, as some people have called them? They called themselves the Tlalmaseuque. These were the land deservers. This, uh, this term in Nahuatl, I think is really significant because it's intransitive. It's not a super active kind of macho thing where we went and conquered and destroyed. No, it was, we went, the activities that we, took, we did won us the, the, the achievement of, of gaining land, gaining territory. So it was um, not so active, more almost passive or more of a case of being deserving. Uh, through various activities. So uh, town founder really fits better the, the term that we often use in English than conqueror from if we're gonna just really try to look at the Nawa point of view. So here's an example where we see a Tlamaseuki land deserver um, being remembered in, in a town history. And in this story, the ancestors figure very largely. Uh, some of these town founders such as this one are remembered as a Chichimeca. And that was an, an ethnic group that came down from the north and helped establish even the Aztec civilization. Um, this one wears a crown, but he also still carries a bow and arrow. So they were like impressive ancestors, but also somewhat uh, non-sedentary, remembered as coming from a, a semi or non-sedentary heritage. Um, but of course they became sedentary and would become agriculturalists and so on after they founded these towns. Um, here's Oh boy, here we go again, I don't want to advance. Mm, well, come to the next slide, please. Uh, well, maybe, there it goes, okay. So here's another town founder. He was also called a Chichimeca, uh, remembered as being from the North and being sort of of that semi-sedentary heritage. He though has the Spanish honorific Don. This was something they embraced right away. Anything that they that could boost their status, they took it on. He also has been baptized. He's Luis Bartolome, a white eagle. Um, he dresses in European clothing. 
uh, and yet he's remembered as living in time in the times prior to the Spanish invasion. So there's a blurring here of past and present. Um, and his his descendants do not really ever say that he's he's European or anything like it. They remember him as a Chichi Mesa. So, um, but he's a town founder. He started the local tradition, and this is in San Pedro, Tlacocalpan. Um, here's another town founder, and I include this one because she's a woman, <laughs> and this is not unusual uh, to have female town founders. So we think of you know our founding fathers. We say in English. It's always the fathers, you know, the mothers forget them. <laughs> but in, in, in central Mexico, among the Nahuas, it was mothers and fathers, oftentimes actually couples. So you know, here's an example where, um, oh, I, I meant to say in that previous slide, she also ironically has taken the name Cortez. So again, if this throws your view of how Nahuas saw colonialism, I mean, it, it should in a way. Um, and yet Cortez was a major figure. He, he was becoming a mythical figure. And of course, when, they, when Nahuas got baptized, they, they often took a Spanish name alongside their Nahuas name. Um, but as I said, women, uh, women were often shown as town founders. They're also shown in the colonial period being present at, at the outdoor scenes where major decisions were being made. Uh, they were at the table, uh, unofficially taking part in what you might call a cabildo, which was a Spanish town council that every indigenous community got to have. Uh, but there were no legitimate or official places for women, but women were still there taking part um, and very active in uh, certain activities you wouldn't expect them to be. I'll come back to that. So here's another example. This is not a Tlaxcalan. Uh, town. This is a Puebla area town, however, where a cacique uh, remembers how after he, his town had the assistance of Spanish allies in fighting the Aztecs, um, at one point Cortes returned to Spain and he was very sad to say goodbye to Cortes, but he hugged him goodbye and Cortes went off. But these indigenous leaders, the four men on the left, uh, felt like they were being left in charge. They felt they were in charge and that, and that Cortes recognized that. Um, over time, these leaders uh, become more what we might call caciques, who were a little bit more self-interested um, and not so much always thinking of the interests of their communities, but of their own personal interests and their families. So that was a gradual change that would take place. Here's another town uh, in the state of Puebla where these Nahuas, uh, four men, um, are being recognized for having a role in a conquista. Um, and they've used the loan word here. This, in fact, this text is in Spanish, but it's a translation from the early 19th century of a 17th century document. And I'm sure originally it was in Nahuatl because they actually have an awkward use of Spanish here. So I think it's someone who's a Nahuatl who is bilingual who translated it. But they are dressed uh, very much here like Spaniards and carry swords. And they've They've said they did participate in a conquista. They've actually used that loan word. Um, so, you know, they, they have over time begun taking on the, the, this perspective, if you will, of the Spanish. Um, but at the same time here, they don't mention a single Spaniard. They did it themselves, whatever this conquest was that they took part in. They just, they want all the glory for themselves. And that's kind of interesting. And then one of them has this surname, Moctezuma, if you can see that. He's ironically came claiming descent from the overthrown Aztec emperor while still imitating Spanish authorities and starting to use their language about conquest. Um, here's another uh, example of a pictorial history. Uh, in, this one is actually still in Nahuatl, though it could be a copy of something earlier. This is a late 17th century pictorial. Um, and, and we begin to see this, uh, what was emerging as a, a distilled view of 1521 or the events of the early 16th century. Uh, we get towns being founded, it's, as it's called. They usually always existed before the Spanish invasion, but I think what, what's really happening is just they're being refounded in a sense. Um, their town boundaries are recognized. There are celebrations, dancing, the playing of wind instruments all around the boundaries. Their town council is being formed. There's an arrival of the new faith. Churches are constructed. Baptism of leaders in a kind of a symbolic, you know, modeling for all the other Nawas, you know, copy us, we are becoming Christians, and this is a really good thing. 
Um, and so the events of 1521 are woven into the local history here in a somewhat vague or a symbolic and distilled manner. So these are the three iconic figures from 500 years ago that came into this late 17th century map. We have El Señor Marquez del Valle, who that was how they referred to Cortez. A lot of times he's just the Marquez and we don't even see his name. Um, we have in the middle there Moctezuma, again, once again, this figure who was defeated um, in the fall of the Aztec Empire, um, but he, he figures prominently, almost iconically. Uh, and then Malin, Ma, Doña Marina Malinche, Malinche or Malincine, she has various ways her name uh, is presented. Uh, inter interestingly, she's wearing a crown there like Mary. So she's, uh, she's becoming kind of a blurred figure there. Um, the fact that there are so many Moctezumas in these local histories in part relates to something Bob was talking about, and that is the workshops that produce documents for a lot of these towns. They incorporated the local narratives, but they also made sure to insert Moctezumas so that their family would grow in fame um, and be very prevalent <laughs> in everyone's history. So that's kind of ironic. Um, but the, the towns needed documents to defend themselves in the courts and protect their territory. So they were avidly purchasing these manuscripts. This, here's two examples from a genealogy that the same family made where they copied over and over again, uh, you know, their ancestors and then the descendants and, and showing uh, how the Moctezumas continued to have a really important place. And this is ironic because today in Mexico, if you know Mexican culture, Cuauhtémoc is more of a hero than Moctezuma. Moctezuma is seen as like a failure. And Cuauhtémoc, while he was killed, he was uh, resisting uh, the, the European invasion. So again, so many different perspectives coming into play. I just want to go back to the Tlalpan Mapa or historical map where baptism is, is being modeled. I just wanted to show you that they are the two indigenous people kneeling and the friar who is carrying out the, the service. And, and the year, 1532. Um, that's possibly close to when uh, uh, friars got to different towns, you know, over a long period of time. It wasn't all that it happened. It didn't all happen in 1521. Uh, and so sometimes, you know, years are kind of meant to, I think, provide a historicity, you know, or maybe that's the actual year. We don't know always, but sometimes it's wrong. Like this one um, from a town uh, in, in part, in just over the border in Oaxaca, uh, where they said that uh, the Marques was uh, present in, in the baptism scene in 1521. So getting very specific again, probably not literally 1521. Um, and this one where uh, Cortes is the padrino <laughs> and uh, this baptism in this town was said to take place in 1554. Cortes had already died by then. So a little bit jumbled, but you know, it, it's like again and again, the baptism scene appears, Cortez plays a major role, everything is distilled and simplified, and Cortez becomes a kind of a, actually it's a very positive figure in a lot of these town histories. Um, I just wanna to mention too, in this particular map, it's super interesting to me how all these chapels and churches um, start to take the place on the landscape of each town with no other, buildings, no houses, no, other, it's just the church. The church becomes like a glyph, a glyph that takes the place of the original hieroglyph uh, for the Altepet, as it was called. It was a city. These were like city states or ethnic states. Um, and in the old maps, as you see here, the each town had its like bell-shaped um, Altepet symbol or hill symbol with various characteristics. And you can see them all around, especially the perimeter of this map from uh, near Tula Hidalgo. The, uh, the interesting thing is at some point, somebody added the churches in um, and you would eventually see the churches take the place of those symbols, those glyphs for each town. The church would just be there instead. And these are painted. I mean, at this point, I don't know who added these churches. The original painting in color was done by a Nawa who still knew how to how to paint and write in glyphs. But at, at some point, the the local Nawa scribe would be actually painting the churches there instead of the Altepet symbols. So um, it's a um, it's a really it's really interesting how how much these churches were embraced. Um, they 
this is not like a frontier mission situation. These people were already sedentary farmers. So when the Christian church came in, they weren't forcing people to make drastic changes in their lives. Um, perhaps that's how they felt. They felt like, sure, uh, they had had a tradition when the Aztecs conquered a lot of these towns, they were expected to take on the gods of the Aztecs, which they did. And now they're taking on some more, if you will, deities. Um, maybe that's how they saw it. Anyway, they did embrace Christianity strongly. And so we've got some really interesting visual representations of that. Um, I also want to say that while glyphs were beginning to fade out over time, there were still, even in, in the second half of the 17th century, these alphabetic manuscripts with a lot of little images. And in this case, these are really glyph-like images. Um, and that's kind of, kind of interesting how either they've survived or they've been revived. Um, in the, in the later colonial period. Uh, and there were so many things about local traditions that perhaps were being revived or maintained uh, over this really long dur duration of 300 years of Spanish colonialism. And then of course, up to today too, in many towns. Here are four more examples of primordial titles as Bob was speaking to you about um, alphabetic texts largely, but still also a lot of pictorial material woven in where we can see ancestors. We hear about Nahuales or, or people who could take an animal form and do all kinds of things. So while we have Spanish cultural influence coming in, we also have long, long lived traditions. I also wanna just say a little something about what we might call, what we might call the crown's paternalism toward indigenous communities. There were many laws passed that protected the indigenous cabildos right to have a semi-autonomous practice. Uh, there were laws passed to protect the Indi indigenous communities territory and, and enough for agriculture for their subsistence and so on. Um, and some people will call that paternalism, but um, the indigenous communities actually remembered the, the kings and even the, some of the viceroys and colonial authorities uh, as, as figures to be appreciated and thanked for this kind of protection, but also for things like grants. Bob mentioned the, the massive production of land grants. There were grants of authority given to their leaders and so on. So it's ironic in a way, all land was indigenous land, but the Spaniards come in and they start giving it out in grants in this you know, very generous way. Um, and people actually kind of got behind it. There was a lot of pomp and circumstance associated with these grants. And then people could take that piece of paper and use it to continue defending their territory over time so that they could kind of become thankful to the leaders. While at the same time, they were not so happy with the Spanish settlers who were coming to live in their midst. There were various statements, many times, uh, anti-Spanish statements made, not about the kings and the viceroys, but about the local Spanish settlers. And there were constant battles in the court and rural riots, um, which were um, trying to defend indigenous communities and strengthen them. And so there are statements like this. You will, you will all lose everything. The Spaniards will come. They will become your friends, compadres, in-laws. They will bring money. They'll go taking away little by little all the lands that are found here. Spaniards come to seize what we have justly won. Spaniards are already coming. Do not show this document to them. Town after town after town had these negative Spanish com comments, but they were not criticizing the overall colonial system. They were criticizing the abuses of their neighbors, neighboring Spaniards who were exceeding their, their boundaries and limits. Um, sorry, uh, one more thing, a few words, and, and then one, one last little story, I'm almost finished. Um, to recap, what Europeans would continue to call a conquest was something very different in the minds of Nawas. What we have justly won, that's their view. Not what we have conquered and destroyed, but what we have, what we deserve and what we, we should maintain. Um, so we begin to see how the whole Spanish invasion and seizure of power and the figures who were major, majorly involved, um, that all becomes kind of a cosmic event. Uh, the wars and the battles that mostly took place in a few communities and in the capital uh, for all across the provinces, this just becomes diminished in their memory. They don't even really realize a lot of times that Cortes, you know, represents an armed force. I mean, he's just becomes like the, the kind man who was there when we got baptized. 
<laughs> and he wasn't even really there. Um, and so the Spanish settlers are strongly criticized, but the overall um, colonial system was not so bad as long as they could continue to go to the courts. And they also rose up in the fields. And this is where I wanted to mention women again. Women were at least as numerous or more numerous than men in, in the rural uprisings and rioting. So men and women were there as town founders and as town defenders, you know, over that whole 300 year period. Um, and then the, the total destruction was not, uh, not even something they would recognize. And this reminds me of a story. I just have to close with this. I'm on Kalapuya land in the state of Oregon. Um, but the guardian of our longhouse here on campus um, told me a story about 1992, which was another observation of a 500 year anniversary. Uh, of course, the Colombian landfall in this hemisphere. And the Klamath people said, invited some Mexica, as they called them, Mexica up from Mexico City to come to Oregon for a kind of a pan-Indian gathering. And they sat down at the table together. And the first thing <clears throat> the Mexica said to the Klamath were, we thought the cowboys killed you all. And the Klamath looked at them and said, we thought the Spanish conquistadores killed you all. And then at the same time, they both said, we are still here. Thank you very much. If I can stop my screen share here. No, oh, no, not that one. That one. Stop share. There we go. All right. Oh, so oh, now we're uh, ready for questions and comments. Oh, wow. Thank you very much. Um, uh, uh, we'll, we'll start with um, one of our participants. There are, there's a number of questions that are put in the chat, but um, this one asked this, uh, but I, I'm not sure who it is, but it says, how are the indigenous allies of Cortez viewed in contemporary Mexico? That's a good question. Um, I'm not sure about right at this moment, but for a long time, uh, Tlaxcala was seen as a nest of traitors, particularly um, around the time of the Mexican Revolution and after that, um, because of their roles. Just the same way that Doña Marina or La Malinche, La Malinche comes to be sort of equated with a Benedict Arnold-like figure. Well, that's based on the fall fallacious way of thinking, basically that all indigenous people are the like and they all think the same way, which people like us and indigenous people themselves actually uh, realize it's not really true. So for instance, um, people like uh, Don Zacarias de Santiago, um, he was very uh, patriotic at Tlaxcalan, I'm sure, uh, but he and his ancestors saw the, the so-called Aztecs or the Mexicas as their mortal enemies, uh, not the same people at all, but you know, different people from a different place. Uh, so we're talking about very micro-patriotic worldviews of uh, indigenous peoples who did not see themselves as all the same, all the same people, even though they did share many cultural things in common. Um, so what's happened is that uh, particularly the, the simplifying effects of things like the black legend kind of cast all indigenous people as a undifferentiated sea of victims um, and expect them all to see themselves in that way. And that's not really how it was at all or, or remains that way. It's definitely- Yeah, just totally agree. Uh, Want to add though, uh, that slide I showed where the indigenous ca uh, cacique is hugging Cortez and saying goodbye to him. Uh, I've worked with the two cronistas, the local historian, young men from that town in looking at that manuscript together. And one of them said to me one day, he said, you know, I've just, I've, it's just been so embarrassing to come from a town that was allied with the Spanish invaders. Um, and then, but then as he grew to understand and read the text in Nahuatl and see how this fit into the bigger picture, um, now his town has totally embraced the narrative and they've painted it all over their municipal palace. They painted scenes from the pictorial. So they're embracing it, but yeah, it was, not just seen by outsiders as a terrible thing, but even by the people, some of the people in those towns. Um, so it's an interesting evolving uh, narrative. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's 
in Atliwetzian, which is where the murderer slash hero uh, Akshoteka ruled in, in the time of the arrival of Cortes, um, you've got this statue, the heroic statue of him uh, that's on a, a street next to a, a plaza. Across the way is a ruined Franciscan monastery, and then there's a newer church. Inside the newer church, it's one of those big lunette paintings of Akshoteka murdering his son Cristobal. So you've got both Akshotekats there. So some people thought he was celebrate, let's celebrate him as this great hero for our community, and then go in the church and there he's a terrible murderer. So it's, you know, I don't know how this gets rec reconciled, but you've got both people there. Well, that fits into one of the other questions. So was Ashoteka, was he a hero or a villain? And you portrayed him as both. I mean, how do you, that was one of the questions here. How do you, what are some ways that I guess someone could try to square that or try to have understanding of why someone would come up with it? I, I think that's part of what's in the question. Well, um, it, it's actual take out as the terrible murderer is, uh, and he gets more and more murderous as things go along. I um, mean, he's in all kinds of, there's, it was a early 18th century play where he's uh, about uh, his martyrdom of his son uh, and the arrival of Cortez and all this. And he's definitely the bad guy. At one point he's depicted riding on a mechanical dragon with a demon in front of him in the sky above the stadium, so just weird stuff like that. Um, but I think from the standpoint of the local nobility who sort of omit the mention of that Akshoteka, the murderous, mur murderous person, um, you know, they're trying to base their own authority on linking their ancestors to them. And these ancestors are people who helped create the current system they're living in. And, who helped guarantee their uh, continued hold on authority at the local level. Um, so they, it'd be very inconvenient if their main uh, indigenous hero, Akshoteka, turns out to be a dastardly murderer. So they just kind of seem to have forgotten or pushed that aside and trumpeted his, his alliance with Cortes, his uh, recognition by that great uh, and uh, sort of idealized figure, as Stephanie's pointed out later, as you know, getting the sword and the image of the Virgin and all things like that. So it plays into their own um, need to maintain a kind of ancestral legitimacy. If their political ancestor uh, who was ruling at the time in their community that Cortez arrived, turns out to be this terrible uh, child murderer, um, then that diminishes them perhaps in their minds as, as you know, keeping and maintaining their own legitimacy. Maybe there were other people who in the community, I, this I don't know because I haven't seen any records like this, but one can imagine there could be a different political faction uh, that might have been pushing the bad actual take out trying to assert their own legitimacy in some other way. I mean, you do see uh, all sorts of political factions uh, and internal fights in indigenous communities throughout the colonial period that sometimes erupt in riots and stuff. I mean, some of the riots uh, end up coming from that. Yeah. I just want to go back to also like the guy who was hugging Cortez. From the point of view of these young men I work with, um, they now like to see him as being very pragmatic. That he, by allying with the Spaniards, he probably put an end right away to the fighting that would have taken place in that town. Like, okay, let's join forces. And so his community was not destroyed because of this alliance. And so it was sort of pragmatic, but also the embrace of Christianity nowadays is seen as a good thing. So yeah, these guys allied with the Spaniards, they welcome Christianity and we're Christians. I mean, they're very fervent Christians. So, mm -hmm. so it is, you know, I think what they're just seeing is there's a complexity to things. Yeah. It's all not black and white, but it, it's great. It's, they are coming to accept that. So that's interesting too. Yeah, the Plus Collins, uh they not only helped the Spaniards knock off the Aztecs, but then they followed the Spaniards all over uh, as they expanded in Mexico and even beyond it. There were Tlaxcalan warriors that went with uh, Pedro de Alvarado 
when he went down to Peru to try and cash in on the, the wars against the Incas there. And they were in Central America, they were in Northern Mexico. Uh, so you can almost see them as, as saying, well, the Aztecs are gone. We're gonna become the next imperial power and use these powerful mercenaries we've got here, the Spaniards, to help us do that. And they could have been thinking sort of along those lines, at least at first. Uh, eventually, of course, it dawned on them. It's not what's going to happen. But uh, yeah. Well, there's another question. This is, uh, it was, I think, particularly for Dr. Wood. But if Malinche or Doña Marina was portrayed as a type of Virgin Mary, how might you understand this? <laughs> I mean, that's that's what I think. I think they think that's what came up from one of the images, correct? Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, and in fact, um, some people like to think her name was not Marina but Maria, um, and so you know, there's a blurring. And in fact, in the Aztec glyph for um, Malinali, which is perhaps what Marina came from, the name. There's a lot of confusion about the name of Doña Marina or La Maninche, but um, it's the same Malinali glyph is used for Maria as well as Marina, as well as Malinali. So, uh, you know, they, they become kind of fused in people's minds. And it's the same, same kind of thing happened with the female town founders. So the founding couples in a way were like um, Jesus and Mary. Or, I mean, I know I hate to make it sound like Jesus and Mary are a couple, but I think there was some confusion <laughs> in, um, in embracing these new figures um, and, and trying to cast them in a way that was more familiar in their traditions where they had founding mothers and fathers, you know. So, um, so Marina is, becomes almost like the partner or the spouse or the founding father with Cortez. <laughs> um, she becomes kind of like Virgin Mary in some ways too. It's, it's a really interesting, I mean, you could, well, there are good books like Camila Townsend's book on on Malinche, but, um, but there's even more that could be said coming out of these narratives from the indigenous communities where she figures so prominently, especially in the pictorials, not so much in the text, but sometimes you get tidbits from the text about how people thought about her. But um, she, in fact, <laughs> she, she becomes more important than Cortez in some of the narratives. In fact, um, you know, <laughs> Cortez was her captain, but I mean, it was like she was the main figure and he was uh, allied with her or he had an identity through her, um, which is also really fascinating because she spoke Nahuatl and she was the first one into every community to be speaking to the local leaders. Um, and he's kind of like trailing along and she talks for him. So she pretty soon has this really powerful voice. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then, yeah, I think she gets confused with Mary. That's hard I, to answer. I, so I think it's, it's a fascinating, it was a fascinating question. It's also yeah, really good. And then, then something else that fits in on that is, um, can you, how might town, uh, women town founders have reflected pre-contact gender understanding? Because ah. you've, got, you've got European ways of understanding gender and that they're coming in contact with this pre-contact system. Yes. And, and then I have a personal question to follow up and I see how you do this and then we'll follow yeah. up with that. Yeah, um, if you look back into <laughs> like Olmec or, or pre-classic uh, say, stone sculptures and other early artifacts, there's very often a duality, male, female. And if you think about, you know, the heteronormative uh, sexual and fertility symbols, I mean, it takes two male and female to create the next generation, right? So I think this coupling became kind of solidified in the culture because you see it all through pre-classic, classic, post-classic, post and then colonial. I mean, it lives on for hundreds of years, this, this imagining of the importance of the male and the female together um, as you know, ancestral figures, first of all, but also town founding figures and on and on. And then in the colonial period, I mean, I think that might even still be partly why women are so active defending their towns. It's not just the men who are supposed to have created the town, but to protect it as well. Um, and, it, and when people, even in the phraseology, look at our founding mothers and fathers, it's always mothers and fathers. It's very, I mean, the women are definitely maybe even thought of first, I don't know, but, but you know, the motherhood, the meaning of mother in Mexican culture is huge still today. And I think that's a Nahua thing. Of course it's European too, but I mean, I think it's really encouraged by that already strong foundation of seeing the, the couple, uh, the formative couple. Yeah, I think that uh, 
what happens is that when Europeans arrive, they project their own ideas about relations between men and women and patriarchy on something. So they, they see women doing mostly domestic things, uh, at least they think they do, and men doing the more male kinds of things. And they, they just assume that the hierarchy of gender is the same there as it was in Spain. Their, their Spain. But um, it seems that the more we study this, the, the more we can see that, well, it's, it's all about value and that the indigenous society didn't tend to value what men did high, more highly than what women did. They recognize there are different things that men and women do, but they didn't have them in a hierarchical system, but rather a complementary one. Although this possibly was breaking down uh, as the Aztec empire becomes more dominated by a sort of militaristic kind of worldview. But anyway, um, you can see the survival of this though, you know, Stephanie mentioned the tumultos or the local riots. Well, I studied one in Tepoztlan, which is a, a town to the south of Valley of Mexico, where one of the leaders of the uh, political faction is mostly made up of men is actually a woman. And she gets arrested as one of the problem people in this riot once it's put down. The Spaniards don't know what to do with her. They can't imagine that she actually has any political power locally, even though she's the head of a faction full of men. Uh, so what they do is they take her to court and, and accuse her of adultery <laughs> instead of some kind of political crime. Because they, they just can't imagine that a woman could have any political power. Was that, that, that because of a Spanish uh, sort of preconception of well, yeah, and then not having political power. So, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, here's a this is a little slightly different question, but it builds on something okay. else you uh, you were you were talking about. But can you elaborate on the indigenous uprisings against local colonizers and how they are represented? Yeah, the best book is by William Taylor, Drinking Homicide and Rebellion. And I have now a new article in press in Mexico, but there hasn't been as much research on this as I would like to see. And Bill wrote his book, you know, years ago, years ago, but 1976, I've forgotten the year, but a long, like long time, time back. Um, but anyway, um, what I see is um, <laughs> in the records, first of all, a lot of the men were maybe off in the cities or on the haciendas working. And so uh, in any given time, in fact, if you go into Mexico today, uh, like in Jalisco, where I visited a lot of towns where they're mostly women and children, the men are off in El Norte trabajando, you know, and, and so the women are there and that's, they're the ones who are feeling like, hey, this Asandalo has just dug a trench that cuts across our territory and they would just go out there and start rioting. And, um, and they were not afraid. I mean, there would be one or two leaders who might be arrested, but for the most part, the Spaniards were kind of like befuddled about how to respond to this violence. They, they would arrest one or two and put them in somebody's house because they didn't think they could put a woman in jail. They would put, put them in, and then the woman would escape. Um, but the rest <laughs> of them would just go back home and the next thing you know, they in the next week, sometimes they were out riding again. So it was just constant, it was huge. And uh, sometimes they quote the women. Unfortunately, we don't have women who wrote the records about these events. They're written by men and often by Spaniards. So they're court records, but they sometimes quote what uh, what the women said, and they are furious, and you know, and they are forthright in their language about what they're doing. Uh, you know, defending their towns. Yeah, one thing they do um, is they'll often break into the local church and take out uh, processional crosses and banners, and then they march along with those as they sort of go into battle against their um, their attackers or people they identify as their attackers. So there again, they're wielding the power of the faith and there are women doing this, uh, yeah. quite interesting. Well, it's like the banner of Guadalupe being carried yeah. in the Mexican independence in the Mexican revolution. I mean, that was continued out of a colonial experience. Um, mm -hmm. And also the women would go into the church and ring the bell mm -hmm. because everybody would hear the bell ring and then all the women would show up um, in response to that. Anyway, one could go Is on. Is there any on. connection to these, the carrying of these, uh, at least in the Christianity, these Christian Catholic symbols, whether the banners or the crosses or ringing the bell. Are there any precursors to something like that, that women or others in a village might have done in, in say, another local sacred spots or some other 
Uh, is there any, any indication that that's part of a, a legacy of something that's pre-contact? Or is that a complete rupture from, uh, from that use of kind of those kinds of symbols? Um, we don't have a lot of examples from pre-contact times. There was a rebellion in Tlatelolco where the women went out and uh, faced the enemy, turned around and lift up their skirts to show their bottoms to the enemy. They also expressed breast milk and threw that at the enemy. So there are lots of... Uh, there that, are was pre -con that was pre-contact. Yeah, that was pre-contact. Now, uh, we don't really know what symbols they might have carried into those battles that might have been like of, of importance in the pre-contact religion. But that, but that was, uh, you know, it shows women's activism and it shows how they had very unusual and interesting tactics that kind of befuddled the enemy the way the same way they would befuddle the Spanish authorities mm -hmm. with their, um, I mean, I have read also where they lifted their skirts in the colonial uprisings and riots. So uh, they, they knew how to shock the enemy, I suppose. Yeah, well, in some 16th century depictions of this fairly famous uh, defense of Plata Loco, that's where this uh, the expression uh, uh, took place, um, there, the women are sort of in the foreground, uh, and then in the background, there's a temple structure. So it's, it's almost like they're the symbol of the town is its temple and they're protecting the temple. So there does seem to be kind of a link between, uh, but of course this is post invasion. So you have to be a little careful. About the record that. is. The record yeah. is. This might, be a, this might be a bit of a projection, but I could kind of have a sense of why, you know, showing your private parts, you do your, you know, your rear end or something, mooning somebody, at least a contemporary sense that would be, yeah. you know, uh, with the throwing of their breast milk, I mean, can you could you elaborate? I, I mean, I'm trying to think of what I realize that would be very shocking, but do, what does it? How would you maybe read that that gesture? I, I it's really a, anyone's guess, but I would say that that was a very considered a very precious liquid, a very um, very much linked with fertility and the power of the female, um, and um, you know, it's something men don't have and. Um, and it, it would be shocking. I think that's not main, mainly I, the way I would see it, but it was like, it had to have a lot of power. I, I think they, would, they wouldn't just waste that. Uh, I think they, th they felt it was gonna really have a lot of power. That's my guess. Wow, wow. Um, Dr. Mejia, I think you had some yes, questions. I I mean, I, question. I've, been kind of, I've been kind of reading some of these questions <laughs> and also throwing in some of my own. Yeah, yeah. No, they're, they're very good questions. Um, so I wonder if all these documents that you found in different towns in Oaxaca, Puebla, Tlaxcala, the Chalco region, um, amount to a, um, to a challenge to the predominant narrative of the colonial period based on all these colonial structures such as the encomienda and the repartimiento. So what's, uh, what's your perspective on that? Um. Well, yeah, I could. Um, I'll go first. I, I guess you could see it as a challenge. I think it. I look at it as more uh, uh, forcing us to realize that uh, this is a very complicated period of time, as in any era of human history, and um, we essentialize it at our peril of not really understanding what's going on. So. Um, what you don't want to do is become an apologist for colonialism because this is more a testimony to the ability of people to persist and survive in sometimes very um, difficult situations and to also come up with narratives and memories that help them do that. But it also shows that they had agency and they're not just victims who this outsiders come and push over or, or, or the old idea that Spaniards destroyed indigenous society. Well, if they destroyed indigenous society, then Mexico wouldn't be Mexico, would it? It wouldn't be the way it is now because there's so much influence coming from the thousand or more years before the Spaniards even arrived on the scene or thousands of years before the Spaniards arrived on the scene that also informs what Mexico and other parts of Latin America are today. Um, so I think in, in a way that challenges the old uh, black and white kind of depiction of things, but I, 
I don't know. I think it enhances our understanding more than ch it challenges us to recognize that things are complicated and we need to, to broaden our uh, approach to things and um, move beyond sort of easy uh, explanations for the way things happen. Yeah, I, I agree. And I would just add one more thing, and that is the audience, the intended audience of these narratives. So uh, some people say they were meant for the courts, they were meant for Spaniards, but in fact, they wouldn't have all these negative remarks about Spaniards if that's where they thought they were going. I mean, they would eventually end up in the courts a lot, but they, I think they're intended for a local audience. This is, they often are speaking to the younger generations. Pay attention to this, watch out for these people. You know, this is really a risky thing, but it's also like, know your town boundaries. Huge chunks of these histories are a recital of all the boundaries of the territory of each town. And it's like, pay attention, young folks, you know, you got to defend this next, you're up next. And, um, and you know, so, <laughs> watch out for those neighbors and defend your lands. And, yeah. you know, they ended up in the courts because that's all they maybe had in some cases and they were trying to defend their territories and they had to have both the Spaniards and the Nawas valued documentation. They documented everything. They wrote everything down. They were both extremely literate uh, writing people. Everything was, every point was one with a piece of paper. And so, you know, they would end up in the courts, but that isn't what I think the intended audience originally was. So mm. audience is really important. I think this was an internal narrative, an internal point of view. This, this is our town history. This is what we think. And it was written by elite males of the indigenous community. So, I mean, I don't think necessarily like that the workers on the, the neighboring estates who were not very well to do necessarily shared the same view, although they were read continually to the town by the leaders so that they would be embraced and it kind of incorporated uh, into the town view, the mm. common viewpoint. So mm. some of them have very elaborate, well, most of them have very elaborate descriptions of the uh, boundaries of the lands being claimed by the community. And um, they're sort of processional in a way you, they move through the landscape past uh, remembered boundaries, which are sometimes natural features, but some of oh, there's a cross over there. And, oh, here's something happened. Uh, like uh, this is where the nobles used to puncture themselves with uh, cactus spines, which sounds like a pre-contact bloodletting ceremony. And also even the coats of arms, when you think here's this very European device that stands for municipal legitimacy and, and stature. But then in one of the primordial titles I've studied, the narrative that goes with the uh, coat of arms is depicted in it, says, um, this will protect us from the Spaniards so that they will not abuse us. So our priests won't cause us trouble and things like that. And you're not gonna write that for an external audience. That's, as Stephanie said, this is for local folks to remember. This is our coat of arms. This is what it can do for us, you know? I, a great question. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I have another question. I don't see anyone asking questions on the chat. No, so let's go ahead. Let's, let's do another question. Uh, <laughs> so moving from the local to a more global um, dimension, I wonder, um, and, and I know there's now a book called Global Indios. Uh, so I was wondering uh, if there are records in Spain about these vis visits by local uh, caciques, local leaders, going to, to Spain? Yeah, uh, definitely are. Um, the, uh, the best narrative I've ever seen of it remains a book published in 1952 by um, a historian named Charles Gibson. Um, <laughs> global Indios. No, there's Global this Indios. Book, is this book you're talking about, Edgar? Yes, that's the one. There's yeah. also this one too, I think is, uh, maybe you've seen this one too, all of you have seen this yeah. one. Yes, yeah, yeah, that one yeah, in my Excellent book yeah. too, it's, collection. It's specifically ab about the, the indigenous groups who went to Spain. Um, uh, Gibson used records extensively from both Mexico and um, from Spain itself to, to kind of discuss what happened. And people have augmented it some, but the, of course, still this old, old, it's as old as I am book. Um, but what happens is indigenous nobles, like uh, most famously from Tlaxcala, did fund trips, several different contingents of local leaders 
to go to meet the kings of, of Spain and to win concessions, we remind, uh, as they were realizing that the uh, Spaniards on the scene weren't necessarily as friendly to their uh, prolonged privileges as perhaps the original conquerors in their memories at least had been. So they go and they uh, go to uh, Spain and uh, meet with the kings. The kings do meet with them. They have audiences. They get various kinds of privileges themselves and for their community. And they come back, they're celebrated in something called the, uh, the town council, the Tlaxcala Nactas, which are town council meetings written in Nahuatl. And uh, there's a lot of stuff about these contingencies that come from their, uh, that source originally. Um, so they're, they're local heroes. And that's one way this Don Zacarias de Santiago becomes a local hero because he was a very prominent member of one of these groups that went to Spain and met personally with the king who honored them. Um, they also, some of the people who went uh, were asked to perform the ball game for Europeans. And there's some drawings from that period from the early 16th century of these ball players. A lot of them got sick and died because they didn't have immunities to the diseases that were circulating in Europe, just as that happened in New Spain as well. Um, but anyway, there, you know, I think uh, Malinche's son went off to Spain uh, and ended up dying in, in a battle there. Um, so yeah, there are a number of people and I think the, the, the stories are kind of uh, not well aggregated, I guess. I no, there's also another sort of genre of literature it has to do with uh, what you might call uh, the, the rise of collecting artifacts from the Americas. and one of the sought after things uh, beginning in the 16th century and after that happened to be uh, feathered uh, mosaics and other kinds of things. In fact, after a while in central Mexico, you get this cottage industry that comes to be uh, where indigenous uh, feather workers who were probably ancestral uh, descendants of, uh, or descendants from ancestors do the same thing. They're creating this feather art simply for the European market. They're avid, wealthy, noble collectors in Europe. And so some <laughs> of the stuff you see in European museums comes from this trade. Uh, people fascinated with these things. Um, uh, and of course, they're originally, the, the first stuff shows up with stuff the conquistadors brought back with them to Spain or whatever. Um, like Moctezuma's headdresses in yeah. Vienna. <laughs> but but getting yeah supposedly but, but getting back to uh, people traveling to Spain, uh, I came across a document not too long ago, uh, dating from the Independence Wars, where uh, a group of of local leaders from Tlaxcala they can't go to Spain themselves as Spain has been at this point invaded by the French. But what they do is they come up with this letter to the um, exiled king uh, and Prince Ferdinand. And they say, you know, we wish we could have come to help you as our ancestors did defend yourself against your enemies, but we can't now, but we're sending you our support in this letter, basically. This thing still exists. So it, this kind of relationship does not end necessarily with the passage of the years. We got time for, I think, probably one more question. I, um, anybody else want to type it, something in or Dr. Mejia, maybe if you have another question for our panel and I could ask lots more questions, but uh, <laughs> this is fascinating. It's fascinating to me. It's complicated. Um, no, please go ahead, Father Rick. Well, I, I, I just, uh, I just, I guess it's more of a comment rather than a question. I just, I liked the, the way um, Dr. Wood put together agency and narrative. And when I think of um, by emphasizing those things, you're em we're emphasizing the creativity and the resiliency of the human person. And I, I think that's those are good words to use. I'm going to probably shamelessly borrow those use in my class. I usually talk a lot about agency because we don't want to just turn people into a cardboard cutout and sort of just turn them into a caricature, a cliche, or a simplification. Um, I'm constantly working to try to get my students the best that I can for them to move beyond sort of dominant sort of cliches or stereotypes or, and help them think more in terms of this agency and narrative. And I think of narrative more than just what people write. It's also the way in which they express themselves culturally and, and in art and music and dance and literature and, 
all kinds of other ways too, you know, so that's the way I understand it. And that's obviously connected deeply to agency. There's a, this human impulse to, for freedom and in expression and so forth. I don't know if you want to have any comments on those before you, before you, um, what I just said. I, I would say, you know, we need to regain an appreciation for civil discourse and how to express our own narratives, which are gonna be varied and multiple um, in a way that other people are open to hearing them and listening and that we can have exchanges that are, are reasoned and civil. And um, you know, I'd love to see that. I mean, here we are presenting something that could really offend some people who love Paul Temelk and wanna, and wanna say, you know, Resistance was the only thing that was legitimate and anything else is trade is a traitor like behavior. Um, we're complicating that and it's I appreciate that people can can listen and see that it is complicated um, and and agency and narrative are very big parts of what this what sort of motivates us to share these these points of view and perspectives uh, or voices. Yeah, I always challenge my students to think of it this way that well who would you rather uh, remember or how would you rather remember the indigenous people as helpless victims or as people who didn't always win and often lost and were often treated poorly but they they tried to maintain agency in their own lives in various ways they never gave up and that's why indigenous society still persists in Mexico. I mean, some people, there was one scholar who I won't name who rather famously um, wrote about the tragedy of success. And he studied the ways in which uh, local indigenous lords in, in Peru in this case, uh, were able to maintain or, their power, but they did so by giving up some of their old culture and adopting things from the Spanish. And he saw that as a tragedy. But then I always thought, well, what do you expect them to do? Uh, you want them to spray themselves and sort of so they'll never change? Would that work? Or was their ability to adapt um, something we should remember and you know, celebrate, celebrate in some ways? Because that's what human societies always do. Uh, they evolve. They take things in. They reject some things. They see, you know, this is, oh, boy, this... This uh, steel knife sure nicer than this this one that's made out of stone. I think I'll take this knife. Doesn't mean they're not still using knives and just decided this is better. I mean, if you think of ourselves, we adopt all sorts of things from other cultures over time. Um, so you know, I think we just need to remember that and and maybe see agency as as something we should, if not celebrate, at least acknowledge it's there, even if it doesn't always end up having the best result there might have been. That's great. I, I think our, our time is over. I think uh, Dr. Haynes coming back in, I think, I thought he was around 4.30, but um, we can continue to, oh, here he is. He's back. He's back. Thank you everyone back. so much. Skulking I'm going to go back. ahead and stop the recording uh, at this point. And thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you in the audience for being with us. Thank you, David, Father David and Edgar for moderating today. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure to be with you.